Hello, I am Denise Sears, President and CEO of SOS International, a Louisville, Kentucky-based global health organization. It is my pleasure to welcome you all for a virtual conversation with the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition that couldn't be more timely around an issue that drives so much conversation today and resonates around the country. Today, we're going to explore America's role in the world and what that means for families here in Kentucky. This is an important conversation and we're honored to have Chairman John Yarmuth with us today. We'll welcome him to the Zoom in a minute with the rest of our panel. I think it is safe to say that amid a worldwide pandemic and an ever-growing number of global crises, the stakes have truly never been higher for America's global leadership. That is why I am so proud to serve as a member of the USGLC Kentucky Advisory Committee. The USGLC is made up of 500 American businesses and humanitarian organizations. A bipartisan national advisory council chaired by Secretary Colin Powell, which includes our nation's top national security and foreign policy leaders, including most every living former Secretary of State. A National Security Advisory Council prized of over 200 retired generals and flag officers. And a Veterans for Smart Power initiative made up of 30,000 veterans from across the country who are committed to strengthening our non-military tools. Here in Kentucky, those on our advisory committee are Republicans, Democrats and independents. We are leaders of the local business, humanitarian and faith communities. We are civic officials and military veterans. And we are joined by states all across the country who have advisory committees just like ours with local leaders sharing how America's role in the world matters to American families. What brings us all together is a belief that when America leads, we all win. It's a belief that strategic investment in diplomacy and development are essential to protecting our national security, advancing our economic interests and projecting the very best of American values. At SOS, we are impacting the life, lives of Kentuckians every day through our local health program and our international program. We are working to advance global health by strengthening health systems around the world from Ethiopia to Honduras to Indonesia, working with companies like UPS to provide life-saving medical supplies and equipment to low-income countries and vulnerable communities. Over the past three decades, we've helped people in 105 countries and saved more than 3.5 million pounds of surplus medical supplies from being thrown away and redeploying them to areas in need. For better or for worse, COVID-19 has underscored the importance of US global engagement and leadership. During this pandemic, we've seen firsthand just how connected our health in Louisville and throughout Kentucky is to the health of other regions in and around the world. SOS has provided medical supplies both to our local community and to communities overseas to help curb the spread of the virus because we know that we won't be safe at home until we're safe around the world. I'm eager to hear more about these critical issues during today's conversation. We are so fortunate to be joined by three true experts to help us think through this. Moderating today's conversation will be Secretary Dan Glickman, who is the Senior Advisor at the U.S. Leadership, Global Leadership Coalition and who serves as Chair of the International Advisory Council and Senior Counselor at APCO Worldwide. Secretary Glickman served as the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture from 1995 through 2001, prior to which he represented Kansas's fourth congressional district for 18 years. We'll also be featuring Michael Kiley. Michael is the president of US government affairs at UPS where he oversees federal, state and local government affairs for the company. He has been with UPS for nearly two decades now. 
excited to have you with us and for your insights into UPS's work in global development. And now to introduce our guest of honor, Representative John Yarmuth, representing Kentucky's third congressional district. He's been hard at work to address the challenges of COVID-19 over the past year and keep Kentuckians safe. Congressman Yarmouth serves as chairman of the powerful House Budget Committee, where he plays a leading role in setting government spending levels, including supporting our investments in international affairs programs. We're especially thankful at SOS to have such a long-standing champion for American civilian tools of development and diplomacy representing Kentucky in Congress. Your support is critical for allowing organizations like ours to make a difference around the world. Secretary Glickman, I'll hand it over to you to begin today's conversation. Well, thank you so much, Denise. It's a pleasure to be in uh Louisville, and uh, I might mention, you didn't say that I was a Kentucky colonel, and it's, uh, it's not on my resume. I suppose I should be most proud of that, uh, John. I, I don't know. It happened many years ago, and uh, I went online, and I see I should become more active and a contributing force to that. So maybe now that I'm here with you, I'll get re-engaged in that. Uh, but uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. You're a longtime friend. We're associates uh, while I was at the Aspen Institute. You're one of the really most respected members of, of the Congress and your leadership on the House Budget Committee makes you one of the leaders in trying to deal with all of the issues regarding how best we allocate the funding of uh, government spending and what we ought to be doing uh, you know, during this pandemic and how America can maintain an engaged role in the world and, and how it helps Kentucky in, in the process. So I guess I would open with just kind of a general question. You have all of these priorities as a as the chairman of the budget committee, and you have to deal with hundreds of people clamoring at you all the time. And mine is more important than yours, so to speak, and you have to make those allocations. But as, as we address the urgent domestic challenges of this pandemic crisis and COVID and all the programs that the Biden administration is talking, talking about, why is it also in our interest to combat this pandemic overseas as well, including support of equitable distribution of vaccines to the developing world? How, how do we do both, basically? <laughs> well, uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks for uh, having me on, on this uh, program. Uh, and thanks for the work that uh, the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition does. Uh, you know, so many of the things we'll be discussing today um, involve the same theme. And the same theme is the world's not getting uh, uh, bigger, it's getting smaller. And we, we clearly know now how things, that, as Denise said, things that happen in virtually anywhere in the world can affect us. And one of the things that we've been, I think we've exceeded anyone else in the world uh, over at least the last decade or so, is our involvement with health issues uh, overseas. And I think it's been a source of goodwill that nobody, no other country has attempted to match. So, you know, again, if, if we can lead in anything, that's a good thing to lead in. And I, so we want to continue that reputation with the Clinton work uh, and, and others. Uh, uh, particularly now, you know, we've led the world in developing the vaccines and China has done a very bad job so far. And it, it's one of these areas where we have have superiority over China and can uh, can emphasize that. You know, they, one of the things that we're still very worried about uh, in dealing with the pandemic is is the issue of variants. And we know there's a Brazilian variant and a South African variant and an English variant. And who knows what else is going to be out there. So clearly, we, to the extent that we can we can get involved in deal, helping other countries deal with with the pandemic, uh, then we we protect ourselves to a certain extent, and uh, that's very important. So, in a in a variety of ways, it's important that we do this. And so, I just follow up. I think it was Will Rogers who said America has two of the greatest friends in the world. They are the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. <laughs> and yeah. and I guess that uh, what we've seen. John is is that in the modern world of today, those oceans don't protect us very well, do they? No, they don't. And um, 
you know, I think what we look back during the Ebola crisis and, and the reason I think that most people would agree, the reason that we didn't have a serious problem with Ebola was because we went to Africa and dealt with it over there, helped them deal with that over there. And, and I think that, that that's a perfect example of why this kind of, of activity is, is very valuable to us. Okay, well, I, I'm going to go from uh, John to Mike Keeley at UPS. And UPS, I have my own personal experience with this. Mike is one of the real global leaders in the world in dealing with uh, uh, not only the pandemic, but the global development issues. As I mentioned, I'm on the board of the World Food Program USA, and, and nobody has done more from a corporate perspective for feeding hungry people in uh, very delicate parts of the world than UPS. And I congratulate you. I know there you're a Louisville company, a very famous Louisville company. I mentioned that, well, I got one of your packages this morning. I don't know how much it's going to cost me, but something. But but any event, uh, uh, we really appreciate what you do. So why are businesses like UPS uniquely positioned to help during crises like COVID? What, what have you learned about this crisis, uh, about the needs for uh, global health security uh, and, and the role of strong supply chains when it comes to both pandemic preparedness as well as let's say food security preparedness. Oh, well, thank you, Ambassador, and, and good to be here on this uh, webinar with you, uh, Congressman Yarmouth. You know, I think uh, this this year, right, this last 12 months, we, we've dealt with so many crises, and, and so many of them are interconnected with global supply chains. As, as you have previously mentioned, the world is so interconnected now that we can't ever again think of ourselves in isolation or policies in isolation. Um, when when the pandemic first struck, the the biggest problem we initially had was these major disruptions in supply chains, and people didn't know what to do, so they began to hoard, right? Um, and then we knew we had to get into the the PPB, PPE business, but nobody knew how to do it. And so what UPS had a very unique ability to do, um, and it really is centered around the, the Louisville global campus, um, where, we, where we connect the globe, is that we had the ability to, to connect manufacturers, suppliers with consumers all over the world. And, and Louisville was the base for that with our customers, with other countries. Um, it became a, a significant base for FEMA. Uh, and we worked with FEMA extensively to, to be able to move the products that they needed quickly through the supply chain. Um, people became a little bit too accustomed to having everything they need just show up at their doorstep or in their company warehouses or even in government warehouses, right? Nobody was really set up for this super quick response that was needed or, or even what do we do to set up testing sites? And it took us a while. It took everybody a while to get that done. Um, as we moved into this phase of vaccines where we are right now, and this really highlights the, the importance of having a strong interconnected global supply chain for health. It's, it's not just the United States that we need to fix this problem in, or it's not just Europe that we need to fix this supply chain in uh, or this problem in. For us to be sort of free of, of, of COVID or to be less restricted by COVID, because I don't know if we're ever going to be free of it, we need to have a fully functioning global supply chain, which is why we have sort of invested so much um, on the humanitarian side, right? So uh, in addition to um, delivering, and I think as of today, we, we delivered our 200 millionth vaccine about 140 million of those are in the United States, uh, close to 60 million uh, globally. Um, we have now set a target working with our partners is that we're gonna be able to deliver close to 3 billion vaccines around the globe, um, which is really an astonishing number when you think about it. But beyond that, you have to set up the logistics of getting the vaccine to those places where it's most in need. Um, and some of the critical infrastructure is not set up or as developed in places uh, like Africa or parts of the Middle East 
And so this is just not as easy as moving standard supplies. You have temperature issues that have to be um, kept in check. So there's a sophistication to this that we've never had to do before. Um, but you have to work with these established partners like Gavi and others, UNICEF. Um, that this entire sort of group working on the global supply chains if we're going to be successful. Um, and, and that's why we, we spend so much time on the issue. That's why we've invested so much money on the issue and trying to springboard um, what we all know is needed to happen during this COVID crisis. Well, when you think that you've uh, supplied, what you said, 200 million vaccines, 60 million overseas, 140 million here. I'm just looking at you and thinking, my goodness, I've finally met somebody who's actually saved a lot of lives, actually made a huge giant difference in the world, all done from, from a company headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, so uh, I just would say thank you for your service. Well, it's it's been um, it's been a pleasure on some of these things. There's been a lot of late nights on the planning side. Um, and I can't stress that enough as we look to the solving the global problem, the amount of planning that's needed to, to get everything done, uh, to go from point A all the way to point B, and that point B is very different for everyone. Um, it's different in Kentucky to, to set up the inoculation sites in Kentucky, um, and, and they're running at full steam right now, but it's a lot harder to get that inoculation clinic uh, set up in Uganda, and we really have to focus on that if we're gonna solve the issue. Well, that's the basic function of the USGLC is to help tie us together. Congressman Yarmouth, I forgot to ask you a question on climate change because yesterday was Earth Day. And I know you've been extremely involved in this issue. And uh, uh, we at USGLC have, have talked about this in terms of almost every activity we're talking about. And, and you know, we relate climate change relates to environmental, public health, national security. And, and I, I don't know, are there any lessons that can be learned from COVID-19 as it relates to climate change? Uh, uh, and, and I wonder if you just can quickly maybe talk about how uh, it relates to the subject about globalization and America's role in the world. Well, you know, uh, I don't wanna get uh, particularly partisan here, but uh, we are uh, in the process of recovering from a, a very uh, damaging four years in terms of uh, our international stature and, and the, the security of our alliances and, and the confidence that we can have in our alliances. And I, I think that just helping with the pandemic is one of those things that can help repair the damage that, that's been done. But clearly uh, doing things like entering re-entering the Paris uh, Accords, that was a very important step that, that President Biden took early on. And, demonstrates our, our sincere commitment to doing something, not just doing something on, on climate change, but being a leader in the effort to do something on climate change. And yesterday, when he announced the goal of reducing carbon emissions by 50% uh, in, in this decade, which is uh, certainly the equivalent of a moonshot, I think, but, but something that to me uh, says to the country, which we haven't had anybody do recently, um, this is a critical top priority. We don't have time to waste. And, and you know, luring uh, uh, Secretary Kerry back to uh, uh, that effort uh, to join him is important. So all of these things are, are you know, I, I think, critical. If we, don't, if we don't lead on climate change, then we're not gonna have very many followers. And that, that's why I think this is so important. And, and the other thing, and this is, maybe more broad than just the area of climate change. But one of the things that I am so happy about with um, President Biden is that he's actually asking the questions in the right order. So for instance, on infrastructure, and of course his, his infrastructure bill is all oriented toward climate change and combating that and energy reform and so forth. But for many, many too many years, Democrats and the Republicans, the, the first question they would ask in dealing with any challenge is, what can we afford to do? And we've reversed that question. And now President Biden is saying, is asking, what do we need to do? 
what do we need to do for our world? What do we need to do for our country? And that's an important reorientation of, uh, of, the, of the role of government. And that's, I think, a, a very positive sign with climate change and, and other issues. Thank you. So we have uh, uh, some of our Kentucky State Advisory Committee members here, and they have some questions. Uh, the first question is from Kay Sargent, who's Executive Director of Sister Cities Kentucky. And I think this relates to cultural exchanges, but it's whatever you want to talk. So I think, uh, Kay, you are on. Do I Thank see you? Again. Okay, there you are. Okay, yes. great. Thank you. And hello, Representative Yarmer. Uh, my name is Kay Sargent, and I'm the Kentucky State Representative for Sister Cities International. Um, as you well know, international connections and cultural exchanges are very important to keeping our country strong, and it also provides significant economic benefits. We had more than 12,000 international students attending Kentucky schools and contributing almost $500 million to the state economy. However, as a result of the pandemic and the decline of global travel, exchange programs were seriously cut back. Would you tell us why you think it is so important that we continue to invest in cultural exchanges after the pandemic is over? Well, sure, Kate, thanks for the question and thanks uh, for the work that you do. You know, I think back uh, when I was in high school, that's a long time ago now, uh, we had one of the first exchange students from a sister city, a, a young woman from uh, Quito, Ecuador. And that was, it was something that was so special to us that here was this, this person from a different culture and, and who spoke uh, a different language, she spoke English as well. But uh, I, just, I just remember the excitement among the students to, to meet somebody who, uh, different than the people they run into every day. And you know, this goes to the, the whole idea of international trust, I think. There's no way better to encourage international trust and cooperation than to, uh, first of all, be w willing to send our kids uh, to other countries and to host uh, kids from other countries here and let them get a sense of what the United States is about. You always fear what you don't know. And it's, it's very important to have people, get as many people from other areas of the world to understand what America is about. Um, you know, maybe some things we don't want them to understand more recently, but, but by and large over time, I think uh, it's been very, very productive for us. And um, I'm sure that you know, we, we end up getting a lot of the best and the brightest from around the world from people who, uh, from those programs ultimately. And so it's, it's a win-win in so many respects. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kay. So next I'm gonna to go to Brian Alvey, who's Senior Director of Governmental and External Affairs, the Kentucky Distillers Association. So Kentucky's known for a lot of things, horse racing, UPS, and and I guess the distilling industry and world famous for that. So Brian, I would uh, call on you. You may wanna ask about exports and, and how uh, your industry sees this uh, local global connection. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I appreciate that and, and uh, you, you pinned it. That's exactly what I was going to ask about. And I would also like to thank uh, everybody that took time out to speak to us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, we know you're all busy and uh, we appreciate uh, uh, the presentation. Congressman Yarmouth, I had a comment and I also jotted down a question, if I may. Uh, first, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you and, and Congressman Barr for being the lead authors on a letter that uh, was recently sent to Ambassador Ty regarding American whiskey tariffs. Uh, and as Kentucky distillers, we see the local global connections every day. Uh, from the sale of our bourbon around the world. And it, as most of you know, uh, our distillers here in Kentucky produce the vast majority of bourbon made around the world. However, those current tariffs that we were speaking of with the EU and the UK and potentially even further so come June have really hampered the industry. Uh, Congressman Yarmouth, I wish, or, or I would ask if you could uh, speak just a little bit about 
uh, the connection between our economy at home and our relationships with our allies, and how can our investments in our partnerships overseas help to ensure that our ties remain strong? Well, again, this is part of the same theme we've been talking about, that uh, if you want to do business in other countries and if you want their cooperation and, and facilitating that business, uh, you have to have mutual trust. And the way you have mutual trust is to show your confidence in them, not just not just say, you can believe me, uh, trust me, you know, I'm, I'm from the United States, you can trust me. No, you, you have to show that, that you deserve that trust. And I think when we make the types of investments that, that we do, that facilitates those, um, that level of confidence and cooperation that we need. Um, this, you know, the, this recent tariff issue is uh, an example of how um, a, a lack of understanding of those types of relationships can cause a real problem. Because when, when the Trump administration put tariffs on steel and aluminum, uh, from, from Europe, and then they had the, the Airbus uh, tariff as well. Europe retaliated, not because they they don't want a lot of bourbon imported into their countries, they did because they were trying to put pressure on Mitch McConnell, who was the majority leader. So there, bourbon became collateral damage in a, in a trade war that made no sense to begin with. So um, that's, again, if you're going to, if you're going to, well, let me put it this way. Um, we're right now trying to do, uh, to negotiate the, uh, uh, the trade re USTR trade representative tie. She's trying to do, and the administration's trying to do what the Trump administration could have done three or four years ago. They could have sat down with, with all these countries and negotiated uh, a reasonable solution. They didn't, they just acted unilaterally and, and generally without any, any understanding of the repercussions. And so we're dealing with that now. It's, it's a cleanup act. Uh, I did get a response from uh, Ms. Tai yesterday and Ambassador Tai, and uh, I, it sounded very positive. She's very much aware of the issue and uh, they're, they're working with the Brits and, and the EU uh, right now to resolve these things. I've, I've spoken personally to the president about it. I've spoken to Cedric Richmond, who's one of his top uh, AIDS, and you know, they're. I think they're confident that uh, when June first comes around, that uh, the tariff on bourbon won't uh, rise by fifty, rise to fifty percent, which would make it, basically make it non-competitive anywhere outside the United States, and would eliminate what is essentially bourbon's only real significant growth prospects. Uh, you know, we've. We probably saturated the U.S. market as much as we can now, but there's there's enormous potential overseas. And by the way, the bourbon industry has made enormous investments uh, based on that op those opportunities. Uh, there's more bourbon in the barrel right now than by far than there ever has been, and that's because of the export potential. So, um, again, this is. The whole it's part of the whole question of, of being able to to have friends overseas to to uh, nurture those relationships so that you don't get into these kind of crazy things which which don't make much sense and uh, I think we have a really solid diplomacy team right now uh, with uh, Tony Blinken and and others and. Uh, somebody who's been involved in foreign affairs for a long time, the president of the United States. So uh, I think things are definitely going to improve. I would just say I've done several of these, and this is the first time we've been talking about bourbon. So I, I see everybody well, smiling on the panel, you know. So. Well, I, I, am the, I, am the, I am the founder and co-chair of the Congressional Bourbon Caucus, which is one of the most popular caucuses on the Hill and is very much bipartisan. One of the I, things, very much I, I would expect that probably to be true, and especially in these times we're in. So I just have one more question before a closing question of you two. Mike, I, I wonder if you might just quickly talk about the competition with China. Um, you know, China has ramped up its economic engagement in Latin America and Africa. They're, they're, their businesses are all over Africa, and re, they recently surpassed the U.S. as Brazil's top trading partner. Um, so as you look at your business, 
Um, how do you see this U.S.-China relationship? What are the dangers if we cede ground to China, particularly in the developing world? Listen, I, I think it's pretty obvious to everyone that China has been very purposeful in their investments and in, in foreign aid uh, all over the globe. And I, I don't believe the U.S. should ever take a backseat in that arena. As, as we are trying to sort of interconnect the globe, um, we need to be leaders in this area as a country and, and not followers. Um, if we establish these, these relationships based off of trust that the Congressman was talking about, uh, I think it leads to greater economic certainty greater stability on the, on the social side. Um, those countries that engage the right way in trade, um, that's non-retaliatory, have, have much better relationships. So I don't believe we should ever be taking a back seat. Um, we know China is, is trying to influence all sorts of economies, uh, not just in, in South America and Africa, but all over the, the you know, the, the Belt and Road Highway that they're trying to build to sort of really push for economic dominance. And it's, it's dominance in, in a lot of ways that they are trying to get at. And I think we need to spend our time building up other economies. And as that happens, the U.S. economy is going to benefit from it uh, and benefit significantly. And uh, John, do you have any comments about that issue, about China and how we deal with China in this in this changing world we're in? Well, one of the things, you know, we all know China is a managed economy. They they don't really have to uh, ask anybody when they decide to set out a course of action and, and they they are very aggressive in trying to uh, advance their interests around the, around the world. And uh, we can't do that. The only way we can compete in that arena, which is to build loyalties around the world and create economic opportunity for us and, and the world, is to uh, have strong allies who will participate with us in those efforts. I mean, just like uh, we couldn't have done whatever you think of the Iran nuclear deal, and I'm a strong supporter of it, we couldn't have done that without the French and the Germans and the Brits, and actually with, with, with Russia and China as well. Uh, and, and now the pressure, the reason that a lot of our sanctions did, wouldn't have worked once we dropped out is because we didn't have the cooperation of our allies in that. They wanted to continue to do business in Iran. So that, again, this is part of the whole theme of this, this session that the, the relationships we have around the world and the investments that are required to build those relationships will help us compete with China on an equal footing. Now we can't do it by ourselves because democracy, we're not gonna commit the, the trillions of dollars that would be necessary to do what they're doing. But with a, a coalition of, of allies and friends, we can uh, have a, as much of a significant in, impact on the world as China is. So I would close by asking you both, this may be a softball question, but, uh, but given the uncertainties in the world, uh, kind of like what gives you hope that we can rise to the challenge of all these problems of stopping the spread of COVID and tracks, rebuilding our economy, providing hope for Americans with, in terms of getting the jobs, and and also uh, the hope that America can be a, a major role in a in the world in a very uncertain time. What I, I'd start with you, John, first, then go to Mike. What what gives you hope that uh, we're on the right track? I guess. Well, January twentieth gave me hope, and it continue, continued continues to give me hope. Um, I must say, I, I didn't have much hope uh, going back to November 3rd of, of last year, but I, I now have considerable hope because we have, we have people who not only understand government, understand what governing is, uh, understand what our role in the world uh, is and should be, uh, but they have really talented people and they're not afraid to uh, act in, in, in very large, dramatic ways. So, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not certainly um, overconfident about our ability to do all these things, but I, I feel much better now that, again, the, the, the administration and uh, at least uh, our side of the aisle in Congress is, is committed to making the kind of uh, efforts to show that government, our government, 
can be a, a very effective uh, uh, force in not only not only for our own people but for the world as well. And uh, so, yeah, I'm hopeful. And Mike, you know, here you are, uh, one of the major companies in the world, and you deliver goods and everywhere. What gives you hope? What, what as as part of your business? You looking down the road? You you positive about what's coming coming down the road? And yeah, I, listen, I think there's a tremendous uh, number of things to be positive about. With, with all the struggles that we went through in this pandemic, there are so many stories of folks rising above it. Um, for all the negativity, sometimes you see on television or, or out there in society, there's people helping their neighbors. There's people helping their communities in ways that never happened before. And I don't know if that gets reported enough. Um, I'm finding us as a business that we're working better together. We're making smarter decisions. We're working faster. We're working and communicating better with our customers, um, not just in the United States, but, a, but across the globe. Um, in a lot of ways, because we had to. The only way we were going to get through this pandemic was really working uh, hard together. And, and sometimes you had to put your competitive nature aside and say, we're, we're doing this not to win, but to defeat the pandemic. Um, and we've seen that in a lot of places. So there's a lot of positivity that's out there if you go and look for it and find it. And, and I think in a lot of ways, we got to celebrate that a little bit more because um, positivity breeds more positivity as far as I'm concerned. Well, first of all, I want to thank both of you, and as well as the, uh, there are a lot of folks from the Kentucky Advisory Committee of USGLC watching this. You know, I'm just looking at a piece of paper that talks about the benefits of the inter international affairs budget for the state of Kentucky. 504,000 jobs in the state of Kentucky uh, were supported by trade in 2018, representing about 20% of all jobs in the state are jobs that are involved in trade, uh, nearly 5,000 companies uh, exporting, almost 80% were small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, Kentucky exported $33 billion in goods to foreign markets, including hopefully more bourbon and uh, a lot more products, including agriculture products, which are close to my heart that uh, Kentucky is of course a, a major state there. So, um, and, and so many other things in the cultural area and, the, and in the education area as well, students studying abroad and students studying in Kentucky. So we thank you uh, both, uh, uh, especially my friend, John Yarmouth, uh, best of luck to you as you try to, uh, prioritize all these spending pressures that are on you. Hopefully you will give special attention to the international affairs budget in this process and keep those UPS goods coming to my house, but uh, perhaps not as often as my wife desires to have them come there. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it anyway. And so, uh, Jeremy, I think I'm gonna turn it over to you right now to uh, close the proceedings. Thank you, uh, Secretary Gluckman. Um, Mike Kiley, thank you, Chairman Yarmouth, for this engaging conversation uh, during this pivotal moment for our country. Thank you also to Denise, Kay, and Brian, along with all of our other Kentucky Advisory Committee members and our veterans for Smart Power who participated in this event today. Also, a big thanks to all the new faces who joined us. We're really appreciative that you all uh, took the time to join us today to thank Chairman Yarmouth for his strong support for America's global leadership. Thanking your member of Congress and sharing your positions is critical to keeping America's leadership around the globe strong so that we can protect our economic interests, our national security, and humanitarian values. Your voice, which is just one among many in USGLC's national bipartisan coalition, makes all the difference. I want to encourage you to take some time to explore USGLC's report on reports. That's our new report that highlights a bipartisan roadmap for US leadership on today's most pressing global challenges. You can download the full report at usglc.org and share the findings of broad consensus across political spectrums with your family, friends, and colleagues. And lastly, for up to the minute updates, make sure that you're on our mailing list, follow us on social media, and join for upcoming virtual events. Uh, thanks again for your support. Enjoy hearing from all of you and look forward to continuing the conversation uh, again soon. Stay well.